And welcome to the show. Um, this week we have uh, a special guest, Jim Hurley he from the San Francisco Experience. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Good morning. Awesome. <laughs> good morning or good evening in the UK. <laughs> uh, we have uh, um, a, a great show uh, coming up. Um, Jim, I'd just like to uh, ask you uh, about the, those early days in broadcast media. I believe you started off in the 80s in Latin America and then sort of moved back into uh, into the US and doing the uh, the co-hosting of a new show. Do you want to tell us, the audience a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, I lived in Latin America for about seven years. My primary business at the time was uh, financial services banking. My first assignment was Quito, Ecuador, uh, 13 miles south of the equator. I used to listen to the BBC World Service every night. To say that we were isolated 13 miles south of the equator and 10,000 feet up uh, is an understatement. So every night I'd come back from the bank, I'd sit down, I'd turn on the BBC World Service. And as I would listen to these uh, posts from all around the world, I thought to myself, you know what, I could do this. I could do this. So I wrote off to the BBC. I told them I lived in Quito, Ecuador. We were coming up on a transition to uh, democracy, civilian government for military rule. And they asked me to, uh, to cover the elections, which I did. Uh, then subsequently covered the inauguration of the democratically elected president. Uh, I had all my press credentials. I expanded that into writing for the Times of London, uh, as well as The Economist. Uh, and then also another business publication, Business Latin America. As you can imagine, the technology in the early 1980s, well, there wasn't any. Uh, there was no internet. Um, when I would call in my stories, I could either phone them in on the state telephone through the state telephone company, which was always being bugged and what have you, or I could write up my stories, take them down to the state um, telecommunications office, and they would teletype them back to London. Wow. Um, when I returned to San Francisco in the late 80s, early 90s, at that point, I got into um, uh, cable TV. Uh, once a week, I would, uh, I would host a program called uh, News Europe. Uh, and uh, so that was my introduction to cable TV. Late 90s, I wrote my debut novel. I was also president of the San Francisco Library Commission. Uh, we are responsible for the 27 public libraries in San Francisco. Uh, that had nothing to do with my writing a novel, but I was surrounded by books. So I thought, you know, gee, I should write one of these. So I did. I wrote my first novel called Deceit and Dirty Money that was published in 1999, 2000, I think it was. And uh, it's, it is in the San Francisco Public Library, actually. It's available on Amazon.com. And then most recently, fast forward to today, COVID lockdown here in San Francisco, starting on March 16th, I initiated my, uh, my podcast on March 27th. I just... Uh, finished my 100th episode last week. It's called The San Francisco Experience. So I went from Latin America phoning in my reports on an antiquated telephone system from South America to high-tech San Francisco uh, doing my doing an interview with you on the internet. Uh, awesome. And reporting on my 100th episode in my podcast. So we that, that, is my, that is my history as a journalist. That's incredible, Jim. That's incredible. And it's interesting you say, um, uh, what sort of uh, got you into it? And when did you realize that uh, you sort of wanted to get into the broadcast media industry? You mentioned about the uh, the BBC Worldwide broadcasts. Uh, I'm, I'm looking myself even for sort of flags or like uh, connecting the dots going backwards. Is, is, uh, is that one of the dots uh, connecting your... Absolutely. I, I lived in England for about eight years when I was a teenager. So I was very familiar with the BBC. I was familiar with The Economist. And as I said, I'd come home from work in Quito, Ecuador. I'd be sitting there. I'd turn on the BBC. I didn't want to hear another word of Spanish because uh, I spoke Spanish all day at the office. So I, the BBC, the World Service, was really my connection to the outside world. And as I would follow the stories from all around the world, I thought to myself, you know, what's going on here in Ecuador may be of interest to BBC, uh, to BBC listeners. And that was sort of the genesis of it. Um, I always enjoyed writing anyway. So 
Uh, so that was kind of the foundation of it. But the inspiration was really listening to the BBC World Service as I, uh, as I sat there 10,000 feet above sea level and 13 miles south of the equator in Quito, Ecuador. But interestingly, fast forward to today, and in fact, um, one of the podcasts that I did on September 4th deals with um, uh, Antifa and Patriot Prayer. Again, my, uh, my podcast is news commentary and news with a California West Coast slant. And uh, in that particular podcast, I covered a story that was first picked up by Vice News. And I, I want to cite that podcast because that brings us full circle from the BBC uh, World Service in the early 1980s in Ecuador to Vice News, which is uh, which covers offbeat stories, but they yeah. have a bit of a global reach. And, you know, it's the power of the Internet that a freelance journalist sitting in Portland, Oregon, was able to get an interview with the Antifa guy who shot and killed the Patriot Prayer guy. Uh, he got an interview with him less than 24 hours before the Antifa guy was shot and killed by U.S. Marshals. And wow. uh, so I was in contact with, uh, with that journalist. His name is Donovan Farley. Um, and again, true, here 40 years later, the, uh, the journalist who's on the ground, who's willing to kind of connect the dots and you know, has the good fortune to get an entree and an introduction to somebody who's controversial, who's got a, a news story, and then nowadays, you can literally load that, that story up on your, your iPhone. And, uh, you know, this, so Farley Donovan, who was the, um, uh, the freelance journalist for Vice News, became a minor celeb uh, for the 24 hours before the Antifa guy got shot by the, uh, by the U.S. Marshals. And in fact, um, his report on Vice News proved to be the epitaph for the Antifa member. His name was Michael Reinol, 48-year-old uh, snowboarder, but also a, um, a big Antifa guy. So again, the pow there's an example, uh, maybe for your listeners, and they're wondering, how do you break into journalism today? And there's an example of how to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because this guy in Portland kept his ear close to the ground. He, I guess he went to the demonstrations. You couldn't avoid them in Portland all summer long. And uh, he was able to get a connection to Michael Reinol and broadcast his story, a live interview with him, uh, less than 24 hours before he was shot and killed by U.S. Marshals. Wow, so, that's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, Vice News, interestingly, and coming back to, you know, the importance of British media, of course, uh, you know, my inspiration, of course, was the BBC World Service. And I still listen to it uh, when I'm up here in Sonoma County. But, um, for instance, I mentioned Vice News. Vice News, which is both internet-based and YouTube-based, and largely is uh, peopled by uh, freelance journalists, Vice News now is associated with The Guardian. Yeah. So Vice News actually gives kind of a, um, a, a reach to The Guardian and a generational reach to The Guardian that they may not have had before. So, you know, once again, I think, uh, you know, I've got uh, to commend uh, British media, and in particular, uh, British news and that tradition of the freelance journalist. I mean, after all, Winston Churchill was a freelance journalist when he covered the Boer War in uh, South Africa. So, uh, so hats off to uh, hats off to British journalism. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess uh, just a hark back to the eighties and nineties and, and how things have changed. Um, is is there anything that you think hasn't changed? in journalism or broadcast media? Uh, well, something that, one thing that hasn't changed in broadcast journalism, and you know, I cited jokingly Winston Churchill, but, but not so jokingly, because when he covered the Boer War in the 1890s, for instance, um, he was the man on the spot. He went to South Africa. He, he was captured as a prisoner. I mean, he, as a journalist, he was not an armchair journalist. He was experiencing those. He was experiencing that directly. Fast. So that tradition continues on today. That has not changed, whether it's the 1980s, the 1990s, the 1890s, yeah. uh, or today. 
I think if, if you want to be a successful freelance journalist, um, you know, your shoe leather, you're getting out there looking for the stories, making the connection, talking to the people who are actually making the news. And, you know, a lot of people that's outside their comfort zone. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, they don't want to get out of their chair. They don't want to get involved with a. Uh, they don't want to get involved with a riot. Maybe it appears to be unsafe, etc. I mean, there still is some danger, if you will, uh, in the broadcast journalism. Journalism, uh, no, not excuse me, the freelance journalism uh, field. For instance, that journalist that I referred to, who got the Michael Rhino um, interview. Michael Rhino was Antifa, and Michael Rhino killed a Patriot Prayer member. So that was the first documented case of Antifa member killing Patriot Prayer member. So the left versus the right. And, you know, so the journalist who covered that for Vice stepped in between, if you will, to, you know, two opposing forces, Antifa and Patriot Prayer. He got the story and he got the story for Michael Rhino, which proved to be his epitaph. So, you know, in that respect, notwithstanding all the bells and whistles of technology that we have today, which is terrific, which is, enables us to do this, but in addition to the technological bells and whistles, still that, you know, the daring, the, the, the luck of being in the right place at the right time, but the yeah. daring to actually go out and find the people who are making the news and and doing stuff that maybe on its face is illegal yeah. uh taking those risks so that hasn't changed and it never will change i don't think yeah uh, and i guess um the things that have changed you know okay so that the studios introduced uh sort of remote cameras with no with no operators but actually i was thinking how social media has uh amplified um the the sort of news up to a level where if people don't have it instantly that the shelf life sort of like just disappears um what's your take on on that you know the sort of instant gratification of news these days and and the short shelf life well i mean no one is better at short shelf life of news than president trump uh and of course the uh and of course twitter and social media in particular but twitter especially has played a major role in in bringing that uh, that short life of uh, that shelf short shelf life of news before us. Now, of course, Twitter has become very uh, controversial during the presidential campaign when uh, they effectively began censoring stories, the Hunter Biden story, among others. Uh, and so, as a result, you've seen this uh, a turn to the right. You've seen a free speech movement emerge here. Uh, in the, in social media, uh, largely led from the conservative right, but not exclusively. Uh, and so I think social media mavens who get their, and after all, most people get their news now from the internet. Yeah. Uh, so we are getting used to a 140 character, or if you go on parlor, I think it's 280 character. Uh, we're getting used to that 140 character, 280 character, uh, uh, soundbite of news. And we can, you know, throughout the day, we can take five, 10 different sound values like that and then move on quickly. And President Trump is the past, ma he mastered that. And yeah. that's, that mastery of social media was why he won in 2016. And there were some other reasons and Russian trolling and all the rest of it. But that ability, I mean, he was visionary in that regard um to to really understand the power of social media whereas hillary clinton didn't get it joe biden doesn't get it but trump does get it but the fact that we now have there's a recognition on the part of the uh, particularly more conservative uh, uh followers of twitter that they're being censored so now they're moving over to uh to parlor to gab which is very controversial gab of course yeah. uh, but the host of there's a host of um right of center free speech uh oriented new uh social media platforms that are coming out and in fact i did a uh i 
that is my last uh, podcast that I just did on uh, on Parler and how they doubled their subscriber base in the first week of November. They went from four and a half million subscribers to 10 million in the space of a week. Wow. Wow. That's some serious numbers. Uh, very and, serious numbers. And, yeah. I, you can imagine all those um uh, all those followers wanting a new platform to go to, which gives them what they want. Um, yeah, it's a, it, incredible what, what's happening right now. Um, and I was just going to um, sort of um, ask you, sort of in, in hindsight, sort of looking back, I know you, um, you're you an author, you're a podcaster, you're a stringer, um, but what, what is the measure of, of success in, in your career? What, what really drives you, Jim? What drives me is, uh, well, podcasting, for instance, that, that has become my, my most recent passion. And I'd summarize podcasting in three words, production, distribution, and promotion. They're the three, that, that is podcasting. Um, I, each podcast that I do takes me about three hours to, uh, to write it up, to record it, and to broadcast it. And then, of course, there's the promotion. Uh, the, the psychic satisfaction of taking a story, maybe an underreported story that, uh, that the media hasn't really focused on, or taking one element of a story that they focused on and doing a deeper dive on that. But I try to keep my yeah. podcast to maybe 20, 25 minutes, which is the average commute time in the United States, once we actually get back to commutes at post-COVID. Yeah. But, that's, but that is my satisfaction. My satisfaction is taking a story doing the research, recording it, putting it out there on the internet. And I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, the San Francisco experience is now on 20 different platforms, uh, including Apple, Spotify, Anchor, Google, et cetera, and some of the smaller ones. But that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Um, you know, when I, when I look at the stats for my podcast and I see that there are, 40, there are listeners in 45 different countries including the UK, I might add. Nice. Uh, <laughs> but there are listeners in 45 different countries tune in and listen to my podcast. And that gives me a lot of satisfaction that I can be sitting here uh, 64 miles north of San Francisco, as I, as I am now, uh, sitting among the redwoods in Sonoma County. And, you know, a, a story and the angle that I see in a story that maybe nobody else saw uh, that I can uh, that I can author that I can publish it I can send it out that is so powerful that is so powerful as compared to as compared to traditional journalism where I would send my report into London an editor would go over it well maybe we'll publish it maybe we won't etc the direct access that podcasting and the internet gives me or any podcaster for that matter because there are what eight hundred thousand plus podcasts now. Yeah. But the direct access that I have to listeners because of this technology is is mind blowing. So to answer your question, that is my psychic satisfaction. The voice that this technology affords me. And obviously you want to use that. Uh, you want to use that responsibly. And, and, and here's to many more episodes. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I, I try to do two episodes a week. I'm working on one today, uh, which is about Governor Gavin Newsom and his filling of the Kamala Harris um, U.S. Senate seat, because obviously when she becomes vice president, she'll have to give up her U.S. Senate seat. So I'll be working on that today. So uh, hopefully your uh, your listeners can tune into that. But, but this is, uh, it, it's su such a powerful uh, technology that we have, and we're only in the infancy of it. We're in the very early days of it. So um, it's a it's very tough. exciting time. It's a very exciting time to be involved with uh, journalism, at, particularly as a freelancer. Yeah. And uh, and again, like I said, uh, not that I'm not not that I'm here to tout Vice Vice News. It's such an unfortunate name. I guess everybody thinks it's a porn site. It's not at yeah. all. Um, but it's but a site like that enables the freelance journalist to uh, you know to, to kind of cross over from the personal podcast into the uh, into the wings, if you will, of traditional broadcast journalism, 
albeit yeah. on the internet and YouTube. So that's what gives me satisfaction. That's what kind of gets me out of bed in the morning and turns on the, uh, to turn on the internet. That's awesome. And if, if you could tell your 18 year old self something now, what would you tell your younger self, Jim? Uh, I would say move to Silicon Valley, get a degree or, or learn how to code and start coding, uh, make friends with a guy by the name of Zuckerberg or Jobs or uh, I would, we, as I said, we are still at the early days of this uh, revolution. And of course, Silicon Valley is right on my doorstep. And I, uh, you know, I, I try to cover some of my stories with a Silicon Valley slant. Uh, I would tell my 18 year old slant, forget about studying law, forget <laughs> about becoming a banker, go to Silicon Valley and begin to acquire the skills because I'm, I'm not really a technical geek type but the point is anybody can learn to code so I in fact I mean if you look at the Bill Gateses and the Mark Zuckerbergs they both dropped out of college neither yeah. of them got a college degree didn't hurt them at all uh, so that's what I would tell myself uh, yeah that would have been, it would have been a very I, whether I would have listened or not I don't know but <laughs> That's fantastic, Jim. And uh, I guess the, the book, uh, Deceit and Dirty Money, that's uh, out now, is it? Deceit and Dirty Money. It's available on Amazon.com. It's a financial thriller. It's uh, set here in San Francisco. It kind of draws on my private banking, wealth management, uh, professional experience, and also my, my time overseas. Um, it's set in the late 1990s, so a kinder and gentler time. Uh, before social media, before the internet, before cell phone, before terrorism. So, um, but it, it's all set in San Francisco, and uh, I commend it to your to your readers. If you want to hear the audio version of it, uh, go to free-ebooks.net, uh, and at free-ebooks.net, the title is slightly different. It's just called Dirty Money again, my name, and you can download an audio version, which runs for about 11 hours. That's even more mind blowing because these characters that I created actually come alive and speak, uh, which, uh, which was a great, uh, a great shock to me when I first listened to it. Yeah. But the, the written version, both the paper version and the Kindle version, the electronic version is available on amazon.com and uh i commend it to you and to your listeners awesome and um you're also your podcast um is available on anchor fm distributing to all the platforms and that's under your name it is uh yeah. my podcast is available it's called the san francisco experience it's available on anchor and spotify as well as apple podcast Ancast, google podbean there's about 20 uh, 20 different platforms that it's available on, but it's uh, Spotify, Anchor, and Apple. They're the big ones. Um, please listen in. Uh, I, I appreciate, uh, please listen in, contact me, uh, give me your thoughts, and um, I would uh, love to cover stories. You know, I, I even, I look to my listeners from time to time for, uh, for stories to cover. Again, I try to cover stories that are uh, here in, with a California slant, or Silicon Valley slant. And so if you or your, uh, or your listeners have a particular story or angle that, uh, that I might be able to develop and do a podcast out of, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Oh, that's awesome, Jim. Well, I'd just like to thank you. And uh, here's to many more episodes. Well, listen, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to, to the next, next time. And uh, again, please tune in to the San Francisco Experience on Anchor, Spotify, and Apple. Okay, okay take, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ben. Bye now.